teacher. Lecture 18, it's about Transformers, robots in disguise. Actually, it's not about robots at all. This is going to be a lecture about functions in disguise. So we've already talked about this concept. Um, so this should come as no, dis no surprise, despite it being in disguise. Um, there are functions in disguise, and there's more than meets the eye. Okay, now that I've gotten all my puns out of the way... Um, if you're looking for a good show on Netflix, you just need to relax. Um, Toys That Made Us, really surprisingly good, okay? And they, they go through, actually one of the episodes is, in fact, Transformers. Um, but they go through some of the old 80s toys, and, and it's really a neat documentary. So, there's my plug for that. Um, okay, so yeah, Soundwave would have been the best here. But, um, yeah, I didn't have that. So, what are we talking about here? Why do we even have Transformers, and, and what's the big deal? Um... Right, this is kind of like it's a transform, it's a transformer, whatever. I mean, the analogy kind of stops there, right? Well, no, actually. <laughs> so, transforms uh, generally should be invertible, and much like transformers, we actually want them to be in the right form to fight various kinds of problems. So, um, and and as a matter of fact, it goes way beyond just the transformers themselves you have to be in the right place so you have different domains right you have like earth domain and cybertron you know which would be like a, a frequency domain and you can only have cars on earth though with our with our transform <laughs> example and the example starts to break down from here right um but basically you have to have it in the right form to do the right job at the right time or at the right frequency as it turns out um so the moral of the story here is that um, although the functions themselves are changing from one place to another, they're also living in a different place, Earth versus uh, Cybertron, right? Or the time domain versus the frequency domain. So all we have to do is keep track of our T's and S's and we'll be in good shape. Okay, so what we're trying to do in this chapter then is we're looking at the inverse Laplace transform. And what that means is that we're trying to go from Cybertron basically back to the time domain, right? We got to get back in time. Anyone? Back to the future fans. So here we are with our technical formula for the inverse Laplace transform. And in fact, this is a really nasty equation. Um, first of all, we have this integral that is... Oof, what the heck is even that thing? This is a, a capital gamma down there. Uh, so what this represents is what's called a contour integral over the closed path gamma. What this amounts to is when we're in the complex plane, we're not just taking an integral over, you know, from here to here. What we actually have to do is take an integral around somewhere and, and do it that way. So that's effectively what's happening. And it's a bit of a mess. So we'd prefer to keep working like we were before, right? With our, just our charts, right? Our charts were super handy. And and uh, ideally, we want to just try to keep solving problems in that fashion where we can take these shortcuts. Um, but we've kind of run out of our proverbial, you know, cards to play here, right? Um what we need is a new method to deal with a generalized class of uh, Laplace domain type of functions, okay? And those type of functions that we're mostly concerned with are uh, rational functions, okay? So what's a rational uh, function? So a rational function in the Laplace domain looks like this, and I'm just going to pull this up. right there. So it's got something up top and something down below. And generally speaking, these are going to be polynomials on top and polynomials down below. Polynomial um, here and here. Okay. And our goal is going to be to factor the denominator so that we can split up these terms of the numerator in some way, shape, or form over these simplified 
fractions, okay? So why would we want to do that? Well, recall from last time that when we had a form like this, it was very easy to turn this into um, something we were familiar with because we had it in our handy chart. These are going to have all kinds of different forms in here, but by and large, when we're dealing with this, what we're going to run across is trying to make terms that look like things in our chart. And this is the best way to do it if we have a friendly function like this. So when we're looking at the two polynomials, okay, the top one here is in the numerator, and these determine what are called our zeros. Okay, so zeros are there. And what I mean by zeros is um, these are the roots of the polynomial in the numerator. Okay? And similarly, we have the roots down here. We call these poles. So these are the roots in the polynomial and denominator, okay? And what it's gonna enable us to do is go back in time, go back to the time domain, right? Um, our focus today will be on the poles, right? We're going to be trying to break out these poles and, and, and distribute our, uh, not really distribute, but create partial fractions that will expand this out for us in a nice kind of way. We're going to talk a lot more about zeros in the future because they play a huge role. Poles and zeros um, combined play a large role in determining the frequency behavior of our system. Okay, there's four major cases, and recall this is for the denominator, i.e. our poles. Okay, I'm going to keep using that term. But this is there's four cases for how to factor out a polynomial, essentially. We have all distinct roots, we have repeated roots, we have just imaginary roots, which would be fine, and then we have complex roots. Recall that for these two, that they always have complex conjugates of one another. If they have one, they have the other, right? Okay. So we're just going to go through the book examples and show you how each case works and how to actually employ uh, the partial fraction method. Okay, so let's look at case one. So case one is this function. We have fs is equal to s squared plus 6s plus 2 over s to the third plus 11s squared plus 31s plus 21, okay? And unless you're, you know, really good at math, um, this is going to be a little bit tricky to, to factor, but it actually factors very nicely uh, into the following. S plus 1, S plus uh, 3, and S plus 7. Now, you could have figured that out by looking at the, the constant here. And generally speaking, we want to eliminate the leading coefficient of our polynomial down there by dividing it out up top or something like that. Um, that'll make it a lot cleaner for us. Okay, so keep that in mind. But you could have seen that 21 is 7 times 3, and you can always throw a 1 at something and, and try to work this out. Um, or you can use MATLAB and just have it solve it for you. There's a, plenty of polynomial solvers out there and inherent to uh, the system. Okay, so there you are. S squared plus 6S plus 2. Okay, now what we want this to eventually look like is the following. We want it to be of this form. S plus 1 plus a2 over s plus 3, plus a3 over s plus 7. Why do we want it in this form? Well, we, we mentioned earlier that uh, this would give us something that is easy to convert back. Okay, so we need to somehow figure out what these three different variables are. Well, I only have one equation here, right? I have this is equal to this. So I have one equation and three unknowns. Hmm. Well, you don't have to uh, be very good at math to realize that's not enough equations for all those unknowns. So to obtain the first variable, what we're going to do is, let me switch colors, let's keep it on blue. Um, what we're going to do is multiply both sides of the equation by s plus 1. 
and then we're going to evaluate it at s equals minus 1. Get rid of the problem child, right, and then see what happens at that point. So here we go. We have s plus 1 is going to go up here, right? So I'm just going to go and write this without it in there. So it's going to be s squared plus 6s plus 2 over s plus 3, s plus 7. Again, I just multiplied by s plus 1, and then this is going to be equal to, and let me write this as a clean new expression, plus a2, s plus 1, over s plus 3, that's a3, over uh, s plus, or times s plus 1 over s plus 7, okay? These two cancel out, and uh, I'm going to evaluate the entire expression at s equals minus 1, at minus 1, plus 2, over minus 1, plus 3, minus 1, plus 7, and that's going to be equal to a 1, right? But this goes to 0. Well, I'll just write it like that. That goes to 0, and that goes to 0, right? So the entire expression here goes away, and I'm just left with a 1 is equal to all this stuff. It's very convenient. Okay, so in practice, you can do it like this. Um, to isolate each variable independently. Another way to approach this problem that's a more generalized version is if you just simply do the addition here and then write it out to match up with those s's. And uh, we, could, we should probably simplify this, right? Uh, we write this out as equal to one-fourth when you do all the, all the math here. All right, so we can actually do the same thing with the other two. We can take a2, which is going to be, when we write all this stuff out, it's going to end up being uh, 9 minus 18 plus 2 over minus 2 times 4. And we end up with, this is equal to 7 eighths. Okay, and then for a3, um, we let's write it this way. We'll write it nicely. Um, for a three, we end up with nine over twenty four, which we got from uh, evaluating. And I'll write this one out just for another sake of example, and that gave us. Um, yeah. Well, you can you can write it. You can plug those in. You know how to do that. Okay. So yeah, that's how we can solve for those particular values. All right. There we go. A1, A2, A3. So now once we have these, we can construct our solution. We end up with uh, minus, oops, minus one fourth over S plus one plus seven eighths over S plus three plus nine over 24 over S plus seven. And that's going to be equal to f of s, and then we can take the inverse Laplace. We know what these all convert to, right? Pretty easily. And that's just going to give us minus one fourth times, uh, recall that this is just going to be our coefficient up in the exponent. So this is minus one times t plus seven eighths e to the minus three times t plus 9 over 24 e to the minus 7 t. Of course, we always like to bring ut along for the ride. So this is going to be equal to my f of t, right? Because I took the inverse Laplace transform. And that's it. That's my final answer for this. If I, if I wanted to convert this expression into the time domain, this is the process, and this is the result at the, at the bottom here. Okay, makes sense? Now, this was for a nice case, right? We had all of these factor out nicely together. Uh, and they all had their own different root. So what happens when that's not the case? Well, then we have case two. What if we have a repeated root? Let's explore that. Case two example. Now, in the homework solutions, uh, I actually have it written out a little bit differently for how to solve it. You know, you can you can do either way, and that's fine. For me, it's a little bit more intuitive to write it out as a um, 
as actually doing the polynomial and you know adding those pieces all together to get the final bit. Um, but in practice, it's a little bit more practical to actually just you know take the shortcuts if you can. Realistically, these problems that we're going to do for like a quiz or something like that are not going to take super long time. Uh, I consider these to be fairly simple, okay? So these are pretty fair game. Um, and when we're looking at doing the Laplace transform stuff, uh, all this kind of stuff is definitely fair game, pretty straightforward. Uh, you should know how to use your integrals and so forth. There's an interesting problem here with orthogonality and exploring this concept of orthogonality. This is probably one of the best um, problems in the book, I think, for explaining what orthogonality really is. You start to get a real good feel for it. So I highly encourage you to look at this section, um, mostly for your future education, because it's going to help. It's going to make life easier for you. I'm not necessarily going to test you on... Um, you know, prove that these two things are orthogonal. That's probably not going to happen on a quiz. But if you want to take, you know, an hour or two to kind of go over this kind of stuff, it's going to really help you in the long run. Um, uh, this problem with the fundamental theorem of calculus is another great problem for uh, building your, your theory level knowledge and being able to do this problem. Um, if you can understand how this works, Man, you're going to be in uh, great shape uh, for for future classes. Uh, let's see here. So we do some basic, solve some differential equations. So we just convert to the uh, to the frequency domain. We do some work. We simplify it. We do the partial fraction method, and then we bring it back down. So today we're mostly focusing on just doing the partial fraction part. We kind of did the this part, right, uh, last time and the time before a little bit, so you should be, know how to do that. Um, but just know that all we're really doing here is solving an ODE. And notice here that we actually didn't do any real complicated differential equation stuff, and this is much simpler than solving this second-order ODE from scratch. Remember, those solutions took, like, multiple pages, right, Of or at least a whole page. This one's just right there. It's done. So that's pretty nice. Here again, we have another second order ODE with, with some initial conditions, in fact. And look at that, it, it is so easy to solve, okay? So this is a really powerful tool for us. Um, we get to sometimes where, you know, we get more complicated expressions, and we're going to talk about these cases, uh, these other cases here in a moment, um, especially this repeated root one. But by and large, they're not too bad. This one is pretty crazy. Okay, what's going on here? Well, I have a second order system with a crazy forcing function and some initial conditions. Wow. Um, doing this in ODE land would have been, um, you know, you probably just dropped a course. <laughs> but uh, with par with partial fractions in, in the Laplace domain, it's not that bad, except you have to do a little bit of algebra here. And I, I chose to show you guys how to do this in a matrix format um, because, to me, this really shows you what's going on with the system uh, a little bit, how you're solving these different parts. The other way you can do it is actually to do it like we're doing here uh, in the lecture today and evaluate it at these individual spots. But it's a lot of hand calculations and stuff, too, so I don't really care for that as much because there's a lot of room to make mistakes on a, on a calculator there. Um, this one here, you just have it in, you, you know, you get to your final spot and you're good to go, but eh, it's a matter of preference. So just know that there's, there's options for how to do this. Okay. There's a, there's a couple different paths to the same solution. And that's all I wanted to really say about it. Okay. So back to case two, let's go ahead and pull this example up. For this one, I'm going to use fs is equal to s squared plus 6s plus 2 over s to the third plus 4s squared plus 5s plus 2. Okay, um, this one is not as easy to see right away what this is going to be, but you could probably guess if it's going to factor nicely. You're going to have an s plus 1 in here, an s plus 2 in here, and as it turns out, I can't have two of these, so if I'm doing an example on double roots, 
It's got to be that one. All right, S squared plus 6S plus 2. Oh, this one's not too bad at all. Um, but now we're going to have to do something a little, little bit different when we do that evaluation. When we write this out, uh, we're going to express it as A1 over S plus 1, right? There's the first root. Um, but then when we get to A2, what we're going to do is actually do S plus 1 squared. And this is a little funky, but recall that um, what this is effectively doing is it's asking us if we have anything to declare that is a, a T in front when we go back to the time domain. This should sound very familiar. Why? Because when we had double roots with ODEs, what did we do? We, we had a T in front of one of the terms of our homogeneous solution. There's nothing new here at all. This is just capturing that uh, ODE time domain version of the same phenomenon here when we have the, the repeated roots. And in this case, the repeated root turns into a power instead of a, uh, a power of s plus 1, or whatever the root is, the power of the root, as opposed to a power of t uh, attached to the exponential function. Okay, that should make sense. So this is not just coming out of nowhere. It's not just an arbitrary rule. It, it has a meaning in the, in the time domain for us. Okay, so how do I solve this thing? Because if I do the same trick I did before, there's going to be trouble over here. And you should be able to see that right away. If I just multiply by S plus 1 um, and, you know, hope that it's going to work out, it ain't going to work out, okay? So what do we do? Well, let's go ahead and take care of the 2 first. So what we're going to do is say uh, S squared plus 6S plus 2, and we're going to multiply both sides by S plus 2. All right, well, that's fine. And then we're going to evaluate it at uh, S equals minus 2. Okay, so that's going to give me A1 times uh, S plus 2 over S plus 1 plus A2 over, uh, excuse me, times S plus 2 over S plus 1 squared. We know that this goes away from last time. We, we saw why that goes away. And what we're left with then, oh, I'm sorry, this, this doesn't go away. So this uh, last one then is just uh, A3 S plus 2 over S plus 2. And we evaluate this side, at, uh, and these cancel out. We evaluate this side at S equals minus 2 as well. So this goes away, this goes away, and we're left with just A3 on this side. So that still works. We have A3 is equal to uh, minus 2 squared plus 6 times 2 plus 2 over 2 plus, oops, minus 2, plus 1 squared. This is 1. Um, and we work this all out, and it ends up being just a simple minus 6, okay? Now we need to find A2 and A1. So we'll solve for the highest order one first, and then we'll just have 1 left over. So if I multiply everything by S plus 1 squared, I won't have an issue. So let's do that. We'll do S equals minus 1 of S squared plus 6S plus 2. And if I multiply, let me get some other color in here. If I multiply this expression by S plus 1 squared, I end up with just S plus 2 down here. Oops, let me get rid of that circle first. S plus 2 down here. And then that's going to be equal to, I'll have my A1, right, and... Uh, s plus 1 squared over s plus 1. I'll have my a2, s plus 1 squared over s plus 1 squared. These are going to cancel politely. And then I'll have uh, a3, but a3 is going to be multiplied times... Um, it doesn't... I mean, I can stick the minus 6 in here too, right? It doesn't really matter. Because it's all going to go away anyways. Uh, this is going to be s plus 1 squared over s plus 2. Uh, no cancellation here, but when I evaluate it at s equals minus 1, this just goes straight to 0. No problem there. And as it turns out, this gives us a result of negative 3. Okay, so what do I do for the last one? Well, so for the last one, I actually, um, I have a lot of work 
done for me, right? So I just need to pick a convenient value of s that is going to allow me to solve this problem nicely. All right, so let's write out what we have so far. We, have, we know that s squared plus 6s plus 2 over s plus 1 squared over s plus 2, and we, we wanted it equal to this a1 over s plus 1 plus a2, which we said was minus 3, s plus 1 squared, plus a minus 6, we found a3, uh, s plus 2. Okay, so we're just missing this variable. We can find that. What we're going to do is evaluate this at s equals 0, and try to figure out what a is when s is equal to 0. And now remember here, we're allowed to do this kind of thing. Why? Because when I'm solving for constants, all I'm doing is just trying to figure out at any point in this equation, and at any point in this equation, um, what is the value of a1? Well, since a1 is a constant, it doesn't matter what value of s is uh, because a1 should not change with respect to s. a1, that is to say, is not a function of s. So by just plugging s equals 0 in, I'm allowed to solve for constants, and that's why this works here. And it works very nicely for us. So if I let s equals 0, it makes a lot of the things go away. You may want to pick a different value of s depending on your situation. Um, you know, consult your doctor <laughs> before taking s equals 0. All right. Uh, Okay, so there we are, we have that side. Uh, most of the stuff goes away when you use zero, so that's why it's convenient for us. Um, so we end up with two over, uh, da, 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 over two, I guess. So that's just equal to one, and that's equal to a one over, well, one. Okay, so I guess that's just a one. Uh, this here just turns into a one as well. So that's just minus three. And the last term turns into 0 plus 2 minus 6 over 2. So, uh, whoops, come on, minus 3. So we have minus 6 here. Pop that over to the other side. Uh, we end up with a1 is equal to 7. Not too bad. Uh, now we have the entire expression. We have f of s is equal to 7 over s plus 1 minus 3 over s plus 1 squared minus 6 over s plus 2. And we take the inverse Laplace transform of each piece independently. So we have 7 times e to the minus t minus 3 and recall what happens with this, we just pop a t in front, e to the minus uh, t, and then minus 6e to the minus 2t. And that's it. That's our final solution. So really not too bad, all in all. If you would have seen what the differential equation was that generated this thing, you'd probably be quite happy <laughs> with this. Um, as you'll see in the homework. So quite a complex solution that we're able to generate out of this thing. And when you're thinking about these problems, right, um, you see how, how crazy these things can get. And we, it really has opened up a lot of doors for us in terms of being able to solve the problem in a realistic time frame. Um, computationally as well, if you were to create an algorithm for this process, you know, just because um, it takes us a long time doesn't mean it takes computers a long time, but if we have a lot of steps in that process, that can get pretty complicated. But if we have some kind of lookup table for format or for our syntax, if we have a, a, a really good way of thinking about it, then we can code something really nice that goes quickly as well. And if you have to solve a lot of these ODEs very quickly, it can get quite cumbersome. So a lot of benefit here. Case three. Imagination. Okay, what if we have imaginary roots down there? And this is to say that we have imaginary roots and also potentially um, some real roots in there. No biggie. 
Um, it's not too bad. We do f of s is equal to, for our example's sake, uh, 2s plus 1 over s to the third plus 2, sorry, plus s squared plus 9s plus 9. Uh, you should probably be able to factor this one. Um, you know, it just kind of putts around a little bit until you get it, but it's uh, s plus 1 times s squared plus 9. Oops, 2s plus 1. It's a little crooked. Um, and we're going to break this out into two parts. We're going to have the s plus 1 part, of course. And for the second part, that's an a1, we're going to have a2s plus a3. This is a little odd. And then we're going to use and we're going to keep s squared plus 9. So we're not going to break this out into imaginary um, fractions. I want you to think for a moment back to our handy dandy chart. And I want you to think about this. What if I broke this up into, let me do it like this, S and then some constant, okay? Some constant here and some constant attached to that. If I have this form, this should look very familiar to you. These are our sine and cosine buddies. Where the heck did we get sines and cosines from? We were working in polynomial land what what is going on well in the frequency domain what is happening is that if i have imaginary pieces this should come as no surprise if i have imaginary pieces they're made up of sines and cosines back in the time domain right they have this um undamped or underdamped uh characteristic <laughs> you might recall the characteristic equation in polynomial so that's where this is coming from. Re recall that this is some kind of exponential uh, decay. And what this is, is just some kind of uh, sine and cosine. Both in the time domain. Okay. Ah, okay. This is all kind of coming together now, right? Because... This should make perfect sense. If I have something that's imaginary here, I know what it translates back to in, in time space. It's, it's wibbly wobbly. So now we have a way to represent imaginary or, or oscillating uh, properties with a very simple polynomial expression. And in fact, um, when we get to the complex case, you're gonna see that we can characterize uh, under damp systems as well using just this uh, Laplace domain, right? This frequency space. So it's very cool uh, to be able to see things through a new light, through a new lens. Okay, so, but we have a little bit of an issue here, right? We can't just magically solve away our problems like we did last time. We have a little bit of an issue. So, for A1, it's pretty easy to deal with, right? We can just uh, divide out and solve away, just like we did before. So um, for A1, we have 2s plus 1 over, and we're going to divide out that, that s plus 1. So we're going to be left with, I'm sorry, multiply out. s squared plus 9 is equal to A1 and you should recognize by now that it'll cancel. Um, and then the s plus 1, if we evaluate everything at s equals minus 1, it's just going to go away for that other term. But I'll, I'll write it out just as a formality this last time here so that you can see it. s squared plus 9 times s plus 1 evaluated at s equals minus 1. Okay, and then this goes away. So now we just evaluate it, and we end up with... A1 is equal to um, minus 1 over 10. Easy. Now, conveniently here, we only have two variables left. Um, but let's see what we can do. Let's try solving our lowest order coefficient first, so A3. So notice here that this is, oops, this is itself a polynomial, right? But what we're going to try to do is isolate A3 by choosing, a, again, a convenient value 
of S to make this work. Well, since uh, S is attached to A2 here, the way I could get rid of A2 is by making S equal zero. So what I do is the following. I'm gonna solve for A3 here. This is the A3 um, methodology. So if I evaluated S equals zero for the entire expression, then what I end up with is the following. And notice here that I, I was careful not to pick something that is a root. If I pick something that's a root and I haven't eliminated it from the equation, that's, that's bad because I'm going to divide by zero and then the entire universe blows up, including Cybertron and Earth. So when I write this out, I get uh, zero s plus one over uh, zero squared plus nine times zero plus one is equal to minus one over 10 times uh, zero, zero plus one. Looking back here, this one. plus a2 times 0 plus a3 over 0 squared plus 9. So I've effectively eliminated the a2 from the equation by evaluating everything at s equals 0. Okay, And this should not be an s, this should be a 2. My apologies. I know you're probably screaming at me from behind your TV screen or computer screen. Um, Oh, before I get to this, let's actually solve it, shall we? <laughs> so we have A3 is equal to, you reduce this out, um, you end up with uh, 19 over 10. You can do the, the simple math here, uh, and it should work out. Okay. Now, with everything solved, um, we're going to select, yet again, another convenient value of S that's going to make things fairly easy to work with for looking at a2 um, and we end up with the following expression we're going to actually solve when s is equal to positive one instead of negative one now what does this do for us well um, it actually just lets a2 sit by itself okay so we have the following two times one plus one over one squared plus nine one plus one is equal to minus one over 10, one plus one. I'm just using this equation and I'm plugging everything in for S as one. Plus uh, A2 times one plus A3, which we just solved is 19 over 10 over one plus nine, okay? Okay, so I've copied the expression over here. Uh, when I isolate A2 and solve, which you should be able to do, it's just a little bit of algebra, a little bit of work, uh, I find that A2 is equal to 1 over 10, okay? And you can simplify this. It's, it's not too bad. Okay, so then let's put everything back together. We have Fs is equal to minus 1 over 10, 1 over S plus 1, plus 1 over 10, S s squared plus 9. And recall here that my original intention, when we looked at this expression, we said, hey, we actually want to break this up into two parts. But we had to keep this together because um, it was easier to deal with that expression that way as it being over this. Okay. Um, for the partial fraction process. Now, in practice, you also... Uh, when you do it the algebraic way, I'll, I'll say, um, where you just straight up add these two bits together and then isolate based on the um, powers of S and solve those equations, then this becomes a little bit more convenient in terms of writing it this way. Okay, so continuing on in our expression. Plus 19 over 10. This is a3 now, 1 over s squared plus 9. 
note here we just split these up based on what coefficients were what. And then I convert this into the time domain. Notice that these two things are not equal. Okay, it's, it's undergone a transformation back to a new space. Ideally, I'd be using different colors this whole time, but there you are. Oops. We know what these are. They're not too bad. Plus 1 over 10. Okay, uh, looking back at our equations, our equation sheet, you should recognize that S over S squared plus 9 gives us a cosine. And that cosine is of 3t. That coefficient of t is based on the square root of this value right here. And then for the uh, sine version, we actually have to do a little bit of compensating. So we need to put a 3 up here to make our lives happy. Right? And so I need to balance that out with an, a 3 down here. Because this is the form of the sine, uh, sine Laplace transform. So this actually becomes 30 here, and then we end up with sine of 3t as well. Ah, cool. We actually got out exactly what we wanted. We have this uh, oscillator along with a decay. Pretty neat stuff. And I can almost, almost guess about what kind of system this was coming in. It probably was a system that is has no resistor in it right? Because it's, it's undamped here. And it had an initial forcing function that was some decay that started off and then tapered. And actually, this is, you know, based on the minus sign, it would look, it would look more like this, but you get the idea. Okay, I know this is like the most exciting thing in the world, right? This is probably, I'm bored just teaching it. Good grief. I can't imagine sitting in front of the computer. All right, everyone, get up and just stretch for a minute, okay? I'll wait. Okay, so in this final example here, what we see is um, we have two terms displayed here. Um, this one is not going to factor very nicely. Oops. And why is that? Well, it's a, it's a complex root. So if you did the, um, the quadratic formula on this, uh, you'd find that you end up with complex... So you have negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac. You can see that uh, this is really large here. So this is going to become a negative under the radical. And uh, then you're left with a real plus or minus um, imaginary. So complex. So what we do to deal with this is we're actually going to re-express this by completing the square. So we complete the square by looking at this. We say s squared plus 4s, and then we say what would what term here would make this come together nicely as some kind of s plus a squared. So 4 would work just fine. And then uh, we have to borrow that from the 13, so we're left with... 9 here. And then what we have is s plus 2 squared plus 9. Now, conveniently, uh, we also have a nice perfect square on this term here, too, as well. So in this instance, we've gotten a nice square. And uh, what this ends up being, then, is the following. And from here, it should be kind of clear um, that we can break this up even further to make this part look like this part, or rather make this part look like the bottom. So we have 5s plus 2 
and then minus 4, we're going to stick on another term. And we're going to divide this over. the s plus 2 squared plus 3 squared. You know, we're going to have some sines and cosines going on here, but this is effectively just shifted, right? We can replace s plus 2 with, you know, an s prime or something like that. Um, and you end up with the form like this, right, where we're going to transform this back and account for the fact that these have been shifted in some way in the frequency domain, which, as you should recall, uh, is just going to be a frequency shift in the time domain when we bring it back, and that's just going to look like an e, uh, an exponential function attached to our, our solution here, where this particular term uh, goes up into that exponent. All right, well, actually, we don't have to do any of the um, partial fractions at this point, right? Because we've broken it up into such a nice form that we don't even have to worry about it anymore. Um, and as it turns out, we just can take this right into the time domain. So f of t must then be equal to 6 times e to the minus t, just using our rules for that first term there, plus 5. And then I've shifted this around a little bit. So I'm going to put in my frequency shift, and then the rest of it is just s over s squared plus 3. So that's just the same thing as my cosine that I had before. And then finally I have minus 4. But recall I need to, you know, balance it out with that 3. I need to have a 3 up there. So if I put a 3 up there, i got to have a 3 down below. And I have, it also is shifted by 2. And so I have a frequency shift by 2 times sine of 3t, okay? So that's it. That's our four examples here that kind of show us this. This one's not a great example, but it gives you a flavor for how to creatively solve um, simply some Laplace transforms that aren't always nice. So there's actually a broader example in the textbook, and I'm going to walk through it in here. Uh, when we talked about functions, right, and looking at the impulse response, we showed that y of t is equal to, and we're going to prove this fact later, right, x of t convolved with ht, and that when we took the Laplace transform, we ended up making this, uh, whoops, not s, or not t, it's s, uh, this just became xs times h of s, right? And so it's of interest to us to, you know, do a little bit of a toy problem here and say, um, what would happen if I had two functions here? What could I do to find the output? And actually finding that output isn't too bad. What it is is we just multiply the two things together and we use our partial fraction method to break it apart in such a way that um, it's easy to convert back to the time domain. So recall what we're doing here is we're given, oops, go away. We are given this and this. Rather than convolve these two expressions together, which really wouldn't be too terribly bad, um, but rather than convolve those two expressions together, what we're going to do is convert both of them into the Laplace domain perform a multiplication operation and get a final expression. That's here. But in order to come back after we've acquired this into the time domain, we need to use partial fractions to bring us back. Okay, we're going to be doing a lot of this um, in the future. So don't, don't panic if it doesn't make any sense to you right now. Um, it will as we move forward. Okay, because we're going to we're going to practice. So, now that I have it broken up, I, I use my partial fraction method, and I end up with an output in the frequency domain, in the Laplace domain, and then it's easy to convert it back to the time domain on those two terms, and so I get my final output here. Okay, that's all this is doing. Now, when you do the convolution integral, you'll end up with the exact same solution. So it doesn't matter if you do, let me write it over here, 
So it doesn't matter if you do this directly, or if you do this roundabout way of x times h over to capital Y and back down to Y. Okay, you have the option to do either, oops, either process, okay? This just happens to be convenient if you already know H and its form in the Laplace domain. And multiplication is generally easier than convolution, right? Partial fractions isn't always nice, but it beats the heck out of a, a really nasty integral or an ODE. So there you have it. So let's see here. If we uh, keep our same impulse response, but we change our forcing function, right? We change our forcing function here. What happens? Well, X becomes, I'm sorry, big X of s becomes 4 over s plus 10. Um, in the last part here, we had 4 over s plus 2. And so now our forms actually match up. So we had, um, we had this for h1, big h1, right? 10 over s plus 10. So if I have 4 over s plus 10 times 10 over s plus 10, and this is x and this is h and these are of s now because they're in the Laplace domain then what I end up with is a squared on the denominator and actually this is pretty easy for us to deal with right we know exactly what this does and it is very trivial for us to solve so now what would have taken us a little bit of time in the integral took us no time at all really uh, to go roundabout way through the Laplace domain it was just a quick trip and it's over. Now, in the as we move forward here, um, we take x3 to be some other function, this, this step function that has been time shifted. And then our transfer function is this nasty sine function, right? Um, what are we gonna do with that? Well, if we do the convolution integral, this could get kinda, kinda hairy because we have some time shifting going on. Not a huge deal, but it's there. Okay, so now when I convert these two things into the Laplace domain, I end up with these two. Recall that, um, let me make this big. I'm sorry, guys. I keep forgetting to do that for you. Um, recall that uh, this is here because of, the, because of the time shift here. Okay, so that simple time shift translates to a time shift shift in the frequency domain, which looks like a frequency shift in the time domain, right? Because of the duality. The duality of shifting. Okay. All right, so we multiply these two together, and we end up with this expression. If we break it apart using partial fractions, this just sits on the outside. And so everything gets this time delay at the end once I've broken up everything else. So interestingly enough, by having a delayed signal tacked into our impulse response, our impulse response didn't really care, or transfer function as it is in the frequency domain, doesn't really care about the starting time, it starts at zero, but this time delay here made the whole system lag, right? And we can see that readily here because it factored out and it now applies to everything applies to all terms in the product, meaning everything is now time lagged when we come back to the time domain. So we apply the partial fraction process here, just like we did before. It's not too bad. Um, solve it s equals zero. And then solve it s equals one, and we get another equation here. Now, in this particular circumstance, we solved for a1 directly, and then we had an equation here, and then we end up with another equation here. Applying, yet again, another convenient uh, numerical method here. So we're, at this point, what we're really doing is just generating our uh, system of equations to solve for us. So if you recall from the, the homework example that I showed you, right, we have this Gimundo 
system of equations that ends up getting generated for this this guy when we simplify through. And I I strongly encourage you guys to look at these examples because if you can if you can figure out what the heck I'm doing in here, um, you'll be able to solve any problem, literally any problem. Sometimes popping in numbers doesn't always work out nicely, and this is kind of a surefire way as long as you as long as you're careful with your denominators and your and your different parts of fractions that you're using, um, this is a surefire way to get the right answer every time. Okay, so take a look at this as well. But the stuff in the book is is a much quicker way. It's a quick and dirty way to get it done. But what you can see here is that in our in our problem, um, what we've essentially created is a system of equations where a2 and a3 are unknown, and we have two equations with two unknowns. Again, this is sort of coming from that fact that we had multiple um, powers of s when we combine all these things together. Okay, uh, that's probably the wrong one to point at, but you get the idea. When we finally solve the system of equations, we get the two values back out, and we replace them in. We get our final form. And notice here that the E is still just sitting on the outside. And that's fine. We had the E sitting on the outside um, right here. So no big deal. We just solved away carefully. Um, when you plug in the, um, the numbers that you're trying to evaluate stuff at, it really doesn't matter because what we're comparing apples to apples is this expression with let me write this out here so you just have it. All right, our apples to apples here was 16, or maybe actually the 16 wasn't even there. We just had 1 over uh, S. Did he keep the 16 in there? Oh, yeah, he did. He kept the 16. So 16 is in there. Uh, S squared plus 16. Okay, so we're just breaking this guy out. So the the whole fr partial fraction process didn't didn't need that e until uh, we get completely done. All right. And now when we convert back, this just accounts as a time lag on everything. So we write this conversion first. So the inverse Laplace is going to be just a step function, right? And actually, let me write it. Uh, let me write it a little bit neater for y'all. So you have it. So the inverse Laplace of 1 over s minus s over s squared plus 4 squared by itself would be equal to um, the unit step function minus, this is easily recognizable as a cosine, uh, cosine of 4t. Okay, and now if I take the Laplace transform inverse, which is just equal to if this is f of t, u of t minus 2 minus cosine 4t minus 2. And for good measure, you could actually do this as 1 minus cosine. And then keep that u of t minus 2 on the outside. Remember, because this cosine actually doesn't start until, um, until the step function starts. Whatever our step function is. Whatever our time lag is associated with that. All right. I'm going to close out here for, for today, guys. Um, sorry, I, I haven't, you know, I didn't get another example in where we actually um, add those pieces together in the alternate method, but you can read the homework and check that out. And this is one of those that you definitely want to do some practice problems on because they're going to show up on the quiz and the final. Un undoubtedly, this process will. So definitely worth your time. Okay, thanks, everybody. Talk to you later.